Warren is the co-founder and CEO of Superwise, the leading platform for model observability. Model observability. With over 15 years of experience leading the development, deployment, and scaling of machine learning products, Oren is an expert machine learning practitioner specializing in ML Ops tools and practices, practices well. Previously, or in managed machine learning activities at Intel's machine learning center and operated a machine learning boutique consulting agency, helping leading tech companies such as Gong, AT&T, and a few others build out their machine learning-based products and infrastructure. We want to welcome you here today, Oren. Thanks for stopping by and talking to us about the not so talked about reasons model monitoring fails. Woohoo! There you go. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, everybody that is here with us live. I was just talking to Oren before we started recording, and we were saying the beautiful thing about coming in live. I know there is the the part that most people are like, ah, I'll watch it later. But being live, there is one thing that you can do that you can't do when you watch it later, and that is ask questions and be part of the conversation. So please ask questions in the chat or in the question and answer. And I will stop Oren at the opportune moment when I feel it is right. And uh, <laughs> the key, what key was it this week? It was C. It was C, easy, good old C, never fails. Lovely C. So anyway, Oren, I'm going to kick it off to you, man. This is just for those that are joining. This is the third talk on model monitoring that we've had in three weeks. It is what I am calling the model monitoring month. So I don't ever want to hear any stories of shit hitting the fan when it comes to machine learning, because we're giving you four model monitoring talks when it's all done with. And that hopefully is enough, <laughs> at least for this year. Um, next year, we're, we'll give more. but. No excuses. All right, y'all. Oren, thanks again. And I will say that, Oren, before I hand it off to you, I want to thank you all at Superwise because you are sponsoring this community. And by you doing that, that ensures that we can continue to grow and continue to make an impact to, with all of these machine learning engineers and DevOps and data scientists that are in the community and learning from us. So thank you and thank Superwise for doing this. It's awesome to have you as a sponsor. And I'm stoked to hear what you got to say about the not so talked about reasons why mono monitoring fails. Cool. So first of all, we are happy to be part of uh, the sponsors of the community. We really love the community. And we really encourage other people to discuss, as you said, a lot about model monitoring. And second of all, I feel that the peak is behind us after your song. So I feel that I could like close the presentation and go home because everything that I will say will be nothing uh, relatively to your song, but I will try to do my best. <laughs> no, man, but, uh, don't worry. If you want, uh, I can also give you some accompaniment with the guitar 
later on <laughs> <laughs> when we have the Q&A section and you answer the questions. I'll, nice I'll play some like lullabies. A webinar alongside the guitar. Yeah, that's yeah. nice. <laughs> so as, hi, everybody. And I'm really excited to be here today. And as uh, Dimitris just said, I totally encourage you to interrupt in the middle and to ask questions because I prefer to, to have it as a conversation instead of just lecturing. So feel free, and Dimitris is here to make sure that I will answer all the questions, so feel free. So Dimitris already sent it, so I, I don't need to talk about it. And of course, given those ni this nice uh, history about me, so I think that like anybody here, I'm a geek of MLOps. And just like to give you a very you know personal, funny story about myself. So I remember like 15 years ago when I deployed my first ever Back then we called it data mining, data mining model. It was like such a lame model based on percentiles and something super simple. I remember after that we deployed the model to production, we told ourselves, okay, you know what? So now we want to achieve like, and to do a lot of new stuff and we don't want to babysit it. So we started to ask ourselves like 15 years ago, how should we monitor it? How should we make sure that it will work continuously without like being, you know, uh, totally invested in it. So I really love MLOps and maybe the name was uh, came to the industry only like two or three years ago, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm really like uh, doing that for the past 15 years. And that's what really led me, you know, to co-found and to be the CEO of Supervise where we are helping other companies and all uh, many different companies around the world globally to make sure that they gain full model observability and they, they gain really full visibility and control regarding their machine learning operations, whether it, and we will talk about it, whether it's for the technology people, the ML engineers and the data scientists, and whether it's for the operational business personas that want to be on top of it and to, to be sure that they are gaining trust regarding their machine learning process. And the key word for today's session is all about scale. So again, everything that we do about model observability and providing it as a service is to do that in order to ensure that you will be able to see, to gain full visibility and control while scaling your activities. And we'll talk a lot about what does it mean to scale your activities. So let's start with the, you know, with the outcome things. So I think that Maybe before going into the details, that's maybe the most important slide of the, of the day. And this is maybe the key lesson that I want you to take out of today's lesson, uh, out of today's uh, webinar. So I think that maybe before, let's, let's start with the good news. Like three years ago, when you were talking about model monitoring with people, I still had to like to, to convince people that they need to do model monitoring. And what does it mean to do model monitoring? And the good news are that, as Dimitri just said, like everybody are now talking about model monitoring. So if I'm like meeting some kind of a practitioner or somebody that already deploying machine learning to production, like everybody understands that they need a model monitoring or model observability solution in place. And it's already part of any kind of MLOps infrastructure blueprint. So that is the good news. The thing that I want to emphasize today, which I think it's more soft, is the fact that if you're only looking on it from a technology perspective, and, and if you're only looking on the technical challenges, like how do you compute drift, how do you compute all kinds of metrics, uh, how do you integrate and so on, of course, that's like the bread and butter of model monitoring and model observability. But if you're only looking on that, you're missing the point. Because you know, eventually, the, the nice thing about the maturity of models and AI right now is that they are actually driving business decisions. So it means that it's totally operationalized and to really to gain the benefits and to foster the trust that you want across the organization, what you need is also to understand that it's not only about the technical challenges, but also operational challenges. So now that you have a model in place, if there is an issue and we'll talk about it, you need to start and take all kinds of considerations like who should own the, the, the issue once we discover such kind of an issue? What should be the SLA process? All kinds of things that are really mature if you're looking on the, you know, the traditional uh, uh, engineering uh, practices, but are still like uh, 
in the data science community are still sometimes being neglected or being considered as just a data scientist problem. And now like there are so many people dependent on your model. There are the business people, the engineering people. So who should know about the issues once they are occur? How should you resolve the issues? What should be the process? What should be the SLA? All of those things are the most important things to, that you need to put in place while implementing your model uh, uh, observability solution. And without that, like you won't really gain the value that you intended to gain from your uh, tool. And to, what we're going to, to do today is to, is to mention a few highlights points regarding stuff that you need to ask yourself and you need to refer to and you must have uh, some kind of an, you know, predefined approach in place whenever you uh, start to do your model monitoring to ensure that you are really gaining the maximum value out of, uh, out of your solution. So let's start. And you know what, before that, I forgot about this slide. So what I wanted to emphasize, and again, I've said it before, that it's all about scale. So not only that there are all kinds of operational aspects like ownership, SLA processes, and so on that you need to put in place, but actually the thing that I think models are quite different than traditional engineering and software that are being software, software pieces that are being deployed to production is the fact that models scale very rapidly. And the problem of doing model monitoring and to do that well, scale so fast. So if you don't put the right processes in place, you will see that very fast you're not on top of it and you're just flooded with too many noise. And for that, I, I just uh, put here a very simple calculator to reflect how much noise it could create for you if you're not putting the right processes in place. For example, let's, let's take into consideration that you have a relatively small operation that, are, that is using machine learning models. So you have only 10 models in place. And let's assume that for each model, you have something like 10 different countries, 10 different customers that you want to monitor inside of each one of your models. And like, let's take an assumption that each one of the models is using dozens or maybe 100 features. And let's assume that you just want to monitor some of the basic things, some like, let's assume five metrics, mean, standard deviation, drift, and, and so on really the basic stuff that you need in order to start a monitor. That means that any minute now, you will produce more than 50,000 data points in every minute, in every hour, and you need to be on top of it. So like before model monitoring, you were in the dark, in, you weren't really able to understand what's going on. Once you put the model monitoring in place, quite fast, it scales very rapidly. And if you want to put the right processes and understanding how to treat this new information that is now being supplied to you, you will be flooded and you won't be able to do nothing. And you will need to hire some kind of a data scientist that will be there just to watch the dashboard all day to make sure that everything is good. So it really is a scary issue. So let's start to touch the questions that you need to ask, to ask yourself and to refer to in order to make sure that you will really gain the right value that you want to gain from it. So when do you really detect some, something interesting in the data points that we just mentioned? I think that like, again, if we'll take the analogy for traditional IT monitoring, traditional IT monitoring is all about testing functionality, right? You're testing that the service is up and running, that the logs are good and everything. And you're actually you know, monitoring a deterministic process, meaning that there is a very clear definition about good and bad. There is a very clear definition, you know, if you will ask a DevOps, every DevOps will tell you, you know what, if I'm monitoring my uh, uh, microservices in production, uh, it's very easy to me to put some kind of an alert with Datadog, with New Relic, with some other tools that whenever uh, the CPU is above 80%, that's bad. I want to know about it. But what about machine learning? Machine learning, when, whenever you monitor it, you are monitoring actually the, the quality aspects of the process. And the process is stochastic by definition, meaning that the data is changing and different, different cases could have different, you know, level of noise in their data or seasonality and everything, which means that, okay, if now I will tell you that the KL divergence distance between your production data set to your training data set, some kind of a drift measure to how your production data is drifting from your baseline or from your training data set, 
is 2.34. Is it bad or is it good? I don't really know, right? It's not like CPU, it's not like memory, it's not, it's not something which is deterministic. So first of all, you need to ask yourself, what should I consider as a real issue? Because if you won't be able to answer such questions, you will be flooded with too many data points that you will need to take a look uh, manually every day on all the dashboards across all the different models to make sure that you're on top of it. And my key uh, uh, answer to this question is that it's actually quite complicated, but the intu intuition behind my solution will be that in order to be on top of your machine learning models in production, you don't want to be surprised. You want to know about anomalies. There isn't really a, you know, any kind of, uh, the absolute numbers are not important. It's not important if the distance score between the drift level is two or whether the drift score is eight. What's important is to detect anomalies and abnormal behaviors. And in this case, you can see, for example, a screenshot from our uh, observability platform where we are monitoring different type of features uh, in a specific use case. And what you can see is that we created an incident where we detected three features that are drifting. What you're seeing here is a metric of drift level relatively to the baseline of uh, the model that was being trained. And you can see that each one of the features actually has a very different scale. One feature, the, the scale levels are between 0 to 25. For other, it's between 1 to 9. For other, it's between 0 to 6. But all of them right now have an anomaly. Some of them are because of out of seasonality. Some of them are just because it's like the abnormal level of values that you are used to get. And that is the, the thing that is most important, the fact that something has changed in the process and you want to be on top of it. So whenever you need to ask yourself, what are issues that I need to know about? Are the issues that you need to know about are changes, are abnormal behaviors. And everything is relatively to the specific metrics that you, the, the specific metric that you are measuring and for the specific population that you are measuring in the specific use case that you have at the moment. So you can't really go and put some kind of a manual threshold on top of all of your models saying drift level above 10 is bad. Everything is relatively in that manner. So that's one key aspect that you need to remember whenever approaching the, uh, the ability to detect interesting issues uh, on top of your model. The second thing, and this is, I think, one of the misconceptions that I'm, I'm seeing all over the place. Like whenever you will ask somebody, okay, so what do you do whenever there is an issue? The obvious answer is, okay, I will retrain my model. Like retraining is some kind of a restart button that will solve everything. And I think that that's like a very misleading uh, uh, thought because first of all, as you will see, there's a lot of other alternatives that you could do, which are much more easy than to do a retraining for your model. And beside of that, actually, as, and, uh, as I will show you in a minute, retraining could actually arm your uh, model uh, performance, as you will see in a minute. Let's assume the following configuration. Let's assume that you are doing a automatic retraining process every week. So we can see that every week we are retraining our model. Let's assume that we are currently here. And whenever we are retraining, we are taking three weeks of data to our training data set which sounds reasonable, okay. Under the assumption that the most recent data is the most relevant data to use. Now let's assume that it's a supervised learning kind of case, which means that we need to have labels in place in order to really to gain training data set. And as you know, in many cases, the labels are not immediately available. So let's assume that we have also one week for maturity of our ground truth to make sure that we have labels in place. So let's assume this is the following configuration. Now, if I will retrain automatically based on the three weeks before that, assuming that it will solve any kind of drift or any kind of issue with my model, could actually arm my, my, uh, my uh, model performance if I had some kind of an issue inside of my training data set. So let's assume that in this specific week, we had actually a data quality issue and my retraining strategy will automatically include this issue as part of the training data set. And of course, it will only mislead my model to create, you know, not optimized patterns and not optimized performance. So this is just a very simple example 
And to give you a, a brief example out of that was actually taken from our platform from one of our customers is uh, this interesting view, which we call the data DNA view. Well, let me explain for a second what you see here because it seems very complicated, but once you will understand the chart, you will see how you could gain a lot of uh, interesting uh, insights out of it. You can see here uh, uh, like a metrics with two dimensional, uh, two dimensional metrics where each uh, point in, in the, which each like square inside the metrics is a combination of uh, two specific dates. Let's say for example, the combination of like comparing the distribution between June uh, uh, 7 to April 3rd. And the, the color that you see is based on the distance score between the distribution between those two dates, between those two dates. So every date with itself is, of course, is totally identical regarding its distribution. So that's why you will see the diagonal is totally white. But what you can see very fast is the fact that, first of all, you could understand that there is some kind of seasonality effect in our data because we always see some kind of five days that look similar and then two days, which are actually the weekend, which look totally different, but look very similar to the two days a week before. And we can see that during April, we had some kind of an interesting event. In this case, it was a data quality issue but something that was changed in the way that the product of our customers was actually working and therefore the data collection and the data distribution of the data was looking totally different. So let's assume that I want to retrain my model on June because I understood that there is some kind of a drift. If I will automatically include the recent data, I will include you know, the abnormal events. So actually, if I will take like the, you know, the naive approach of like retraining automatically, thinking that it will solve all of my needs and all of uh, the possible issues, of course, it will just do me more damage than good. So what you can do about it? Actually, there's a lot that you can do about it to resolve issues. And I think this is one of the things that people don't really uh, understand enough that the, you know, the range of possible things that you could do is really quite a, a big range. It could be, for example, if we talked about data integrity issue, it could be to go and fix the upstream, the upstream data source that created uh, the data issue in one of our uh, data pipelines. It could be that if we detected that only a specific subpopulation is now drifting, maybe we don't need, need really to retrain the entire model. Maybe we just need to split it to, to create a different model for this specific subpopulation to make sure that we are well optimized for this subpopulation. Maybe, as we said, sometimes you just need to retrain it. And, and there are a lot of other uh, additional options, like recalibrate your model. For example, let's say that you're doing some kind of a regression model to predict house prices in a specific neighborhood. And maybe the patterns are quite stable, but all the prices around the marketplace are now uh, becoming much more expensive. So maybe the only thing that you need to do is just to recalibrate your model, meaning to take the the output of your model and maybe to increase it by 10%, 20%. You don't really need to retrain the model. You just need to a bit to recalibrate the result of your model uh, uh, and the way that is producing results. Sometimes you could only refit some of the pre-processing parameters like uh, uh, refitting the Z score or the mean or standard deviation values that you're using to scale your uh, features or similar stuff. This could also help you to actually to become more relevant to the existing state without doing a fully retraining mechanism. And uh, of course that you could also adjust for, for example, for classification models, you could just adjust the binary threshold to decide whether we will go more conservative or more uh, uh, intrusive regarding our uh, way to decide uh, whether we want to approve a specific case or not. I see Dimitris wanting to ask any, any, any question, yeah. Well, so this is something that comes up quite a bit and I find it fascinating. Really what I'm wondering is, do you normally recommend this flow or workflow, I guess, of the automatic retraining? Uh, and I thought of this because I remember one of the first people that we had on the uh, community meetup a year and a half ago or whatever uh, was Shuby Jane from 
Survey Monkey, and he was talking about how I asked him that same question, like, can you automatically retrain when you detect a certain amount of drift and then you just put something new out there? And he said that we have that capability, but we don't really use it as much as you would think. And I imagine it's for a lot of these reasons that you're talking about. So do you do you advise to maybe not be so bullish on the whole, uh, let's automatically retrain and get something that is with the freshest data out there um, and then make it as easy as possible. So the engineers and the data scientists don't even have to think about it. It's just already done. So that's a great question because from one end you want automation to make sure that again, in order to support a scale of your models, you don't want to do all kind of manual stuff. On the other end, as we just talked, retraining is not like the optimal solution for everything. So what I'm suggesting is actually to put some kind of an automated retraining process in place in order that for you not to wake up every you know Tuesday or something and to think whether I should retrain my model or not. But, and as we will see in a moment, whenever you detect issues, you need to make sure that you are taking the right actions, which sometimes could be different actions than retraining. So what I'm suggesting is a process that you need to be able to detect issues automatically, as we said, using all kinds of anomaly detection techniques, because you are not able to scan manually everything and to make sure that you're on top of everything. everything. Once you detect issues, you really need to make sure that you get the full context of what's going on, what's actually happening right now, whether it's some kind of an issue because of my model inputs, whether there's some kind of data integrity issue. And once you have everything in place, you need to automate the process of what are the alternatives. Okay, so what can I do in this case? Whenever I see all kind of, let's say, I, I see issue uh, in the level of missing values with my features. So I could suggest it to the users that need to own this process. In this case, it will be the ML engineering person. And he should get all kinds of options pre-made in advance. Like, do you want to go and fix it manually in your upstream data sources? Do you want maybe to change the threshold right now to make sure that we're on top of it? You want maybe to do some kind of a safety net and to replace the model with some kind of a decision rule until you will fix the issue in the data pipelines? So you need to put some kind of a retraining strategy in place, but you need to make sure that you have a very effective way to resolve issues and automate and providing like halfway through the process of resolving the issue to make sure that uh, uh, the different persona that are getting the alerts will be uh, will have the right alternative in place that are not always written. I like that word you just said there, the retraining strategy. It's like, what is the strategy when you need to go through this? And maybe you have a checklist or maybe you have like a decision graph that you can go through. And so very cool. I'll let you continue now. And I won't interrupt oh, you. you know, actually, I that's, a, that's a great question toward my next slide because the next slide is asking, okay, so how do you know what is... And again, like we're talking about pitfalls. So a, a very common pitfall is just to think that a retraining will solve everything. So I'm saying that you have all kinds of different options. So how could you know what option to take? So it's all about context and point of view. Let's take, for example, this case where we have a model, a binary classification model, where it, uh, it needs to predict whether a specific visitor in our website is actually a male or female. And let's assume that uh, usually it's uh, like uh, we're seeing something like 30% male and 70% woman. So now we're starting to see some kind of a drift in our model output. Model is outputting 60% of uh, male and 40% woman. That, this is something interesting. This is something that we want to be on top of it. We want to understand that the process is changing. Something is happening. So what should you do? Should you retrain? Should you fix something in the data pipeline? You can't really know if you're only looking on your model decisions. Again, the model decision process is actually made up of inputs and all kinds of raw elements that are entering into the process, the model output, and eventually it will create some kind of an ROI or performance to your business. So in order to really to understand what are the right steps to move forward, you really need to gain the full context of the process. You need to make sure that alongside the anomaly of your model output, you need to see what is going on with my model input. 
And in this case, you could see, okay, now that I'm gaining the full picture, understanding all the different elements that are entering into the process, and I will see the correlation between them, that whenever I add this model decision shift, I also see a correlated event with some kind of an element uh, that currently is experiencing data quality issue. So correlation is not exactly causality, but it is some good start to, to understand why it's happening. And it could be that uh, probably the issue is because some kind of a data quality issue and not a real cost of drift of the world that you need to readjust to it. So again, there are a lot of alternatives to just retrain your model. And in order to understand what is the right alternative, you really need to gain full observability about the full process and to understand what's going on with your model inputs, with your model outputs, how the labels are looking like, and what is the current performance level that your business is experiencing. So there's a question coming through here asking about if you can talk more about the case where adding additional replicas isn't sufficient to scale an ML model. For instance, a REST endpoint for inference with a fixed model version initially came to mind. Do you have another use case in mind? So I was referring to a bit of a different thing. Let me explain what I was referring to. And if uh, the question will still be relevant, so I will be happy to answer it. What I was trying to say is that in traditional software, in order to scale, you're just creating another replicas of your software, which means that they are copy exactly of your software. So whatever you determine is good or bad will be also applicable for the additional replicas that you're creating. But let's assume that I'm creating a, a machine learning learning process where I'm like initiating it for each and every customer of mine. It means that the, the fact that I was scaling my, my models is actually creating not copy exactly replicas, but I'm actually creating different models in place where maybe it's the same code, but for each case we have different data, which means that again, the behavior and the level of like noise and, and seasonality could be quite different between the different replicas because they are not identical. That was referring to the fact that like, it's really how to define what is an abnormal event because for maybe for a specific country, like uh, we don't, experience any kind of noise and the data is very stable. So any kind of drift, it should be some kind of an abnormal event that we need to know about. And in other countries, it could be that the situation is so noisy, so like only like huge drift should be considered as some kind of an event that we need to respond to. Excellent. Cool. So I will move on quickly. So it's all about the point of view. And that's another, we talked about organ, organizational aspect. So again, it's, I think that companies that are referring to model observability as a problem that the data scientists need to be on top of it, and that's it, are missing the point. Because again, now this is the process that is driving your business. So, you know, you have different, it's a multidisciplinary kind of uh, thing that, all the, in order to really, and whenever I, in any case that I see a very successful AI and machine learning implementation and a very, you know, I end the culture regarding machine learning, I always see the multidisciplinary approach where different personas are being involved. Not only the data scientists, not only the main engineers, but everybody are like building trust with the, with the, models and that's because they have like one common source of truth that everybody could you know extract the insight that they want out of it so again we have different persona we have the data scientist we have the ml engineer and we have the business persona and the key thing that we need to understand is that all of them really care about the process but each one of them care about different aspects for example as a data scientist you're all about optimizing your models so what are the type of issues that you want to know? You want to know about drifts. You want to, you want to know about weak spots. You want to know about uh, whether my model is still relevant since my last retraining. The ML engineering is all about building the right infrastructure in place. And you want to make sure that it's healthy and the orchestration is working properly. So you really want to know about issues like if there is some kind of an increasing event with uh, some kind of a data quality issue, uh, whether there is some kind of uh, issue with one of his data sources. While the business want to be on top of everything. So let's assume that 
The model is start, like we have a fraud detection model, a binary classification fraud detection model, and it's starting to deny more transactions. So that's something that the business should know about. So different persona want to know about different stuff. And that means that you need, again, because it's now an a, 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 a operational process, you need to put the right owner on the right type of issues. So in a very mature model observability uh, implementation, what you will see is that there are different use cases that are being defined and that are being, you know, uh, searched to, to detect any kind of issue about them. And for each one of them, there is a different owner. For one of them, for example, model outputs, drift, maybe the business want to know about it. For uh, data integrity issues, ML engineers need to know about it. And maybe it's not even one-to-one, -one. maybe it's one-to-many, maybe for uh, the last case, the business and the data scientists know, need to know about it. But the important stuff is to understand that you need, in order to really to foster trust and to build a very mature organization, you need to be able to reflect the, the different issues to the different personas in a very you know, clear processes and clear ownership regarding who should own what issue. And taking it another step forward, a very easy way to make sure that your, your uh, model observability implementation will fail is to create more work to these personas that we just talked about. If you will create a silo, like a, a, a platform, a solution, where people need to go into and to search the things that they were just alerted by, uh, for, uh, you will guarantee that it will fail because people don't want to create more work for them. They really, you know, transition from being from taking a look on models and data science from an experimentation kind of way to an operational kind of way mean that you need to be embedded as part of the existing tools and the existing processes. So for example, the business is used to work with emails and BI dashboard. So you need to make sure that anything that you want to reflect to you, you are able to launch to those specific places that you need to provide APIs so you will be able to reflect all the elements, not inside a dedicated platform that you need to visit every day, but he, will, he could open his existing BI dashboard and see all kinds of elements that are being produced by your monitoring solution. Your ML engineers, you will usually will work with some kind of an observability platform like New Relic, Datadog, Prometheus, and, and others. So let make, let's make sure that your model observability solution will uh, produce the, the issues and the right metrics for him to the places that he's used to visit that, or maybe to, to send him the incidents and the issues through Slack integration or PagerDuty in order to make sure that he has like, you know, clear SLA and clear processes to treat those things without going into your dedicated solution. So it's all about, you know, building the right solution to the right persona, meaning that you need to, to make sure that you're sending the right type of issues to the right persona, and you are sending it to a very relevant place for them to see that and to be effective uh, uh, to interact with. And the last thing that I want to mention is the fact that model development or model life cycle is not linear. And sometimes people like look, on, you know, there are all kinds of different uh, ways and paradigms to look on a machine learning life cycle. And all of them eventually could be, you know, Chris DM or others could be looked in like uh, four main pillars. There is the area where you need to define the business need. There is the area where you need to do the heavy algorithmic research, the implementation side, the engineering side, and of course the monitoring in the end. But if you look on it as a linear process, you're missing the point. Because again, maybe, just to do monitoring and to get alerts eventually, that's, that's, that's good. But the, th the nice thing that once you put a monitoring or observability solution in place in production is the fact that you now could be actually production first, meaning that you could empower the different phases with production insights. Instead of the business need or like the research phase to be based on some assumptions or like beliefs that uh, your data scientists will do, you could actually take a look on production to understand what's going on, how my data in production actually behave. Or like we saw in the retraining question, you could see what is the current situation with my model in production. What are the relevant history in order to retrain my model and to take those insights? What are the places that my model is currently experiencing bad 
bad performance. Take those insights from production to your next research iteration to make sure that you're improving the process. Whenever you want to implement and to deploy now a new model, so let's do a safe fallout giving uh, advanced capabilities uh, uh, with, uh, with given advanced monitoring capabilities in production. Let's make sure that uh, the implementation phase is, is uh, being guaranteed by having like a safe rollout where our monitoring solution will make sure that we are only uh, uploading uh, and putting you no know, valid uh, models in place. So actually taking a look on it as a circle and as an iterative process, this is a key thing to understand that if you will take advantage of all the information that you have from production and you will start to be production first while doing your next iteration of research and implementation, it will give you much more power and much more ability to create better and more optimized uh, models uh, in your next research. So I just want to, again, to, to, to put everything in one place. So if I want, again, for you to take some kind of a key lesson out of this today's session, is the fact that to really achieve model observability in a very effective way, in a way that won't fail in production, you need to make sure that you're answering all of those questions in advance or while you're doing the implementation of your model observability. And they are not just as afterthought, because if they will be uh, treated as afterthought, you will deploy to production, you will start to scale, you will start to get a lot of different data points, and you won't have anything to do about them. You won't be able to understand what once something interesting is happening, you won't be able to, you know, to interact with the relevant people once you need to do that. So please ask yourself, when should I consider things as issues that I need to know about? What should I, what could I do about it? It's not only retraining, please remember that. Uh, in order to understand what should I do about it, you need to gain the full context about what's going on, not only detecting one specific alert on one specific metric, but you need to gain the full context about what's going on with the entire process right now. We need to understand who should be responsible of each, of each issue, where should we let them know about that, and how could we improve our process by, again, getting a lot of production insights into our next iteration of model development. So I think that's it uh, for uh, me for today. We'll be happy to take questions. All right, I've got a few questions, but I also want to hand it over to the crowd in case there's anything that anyone wants to ask. First thing that I'm interested in hearing about, uh, and first of all, I love this idea of production first and that mentality. Maybe you can just go into it. I know you went into it in that slide, but bridging the gap between production first and like R&D and how what is it? You're changing the mindset of looking at everything that is in production before you are making decisions? Like, how does that actually play out? So, you know, like, as a data scientist myself, I think that in many things that whenever you meet, whenever I meet my peers and I'm asking them, so whenever you're approaching your next model development cycle, what data, what data are you going to use? Even though that they are data scientists and they should be totally data driven, they are answering based on beliefs. So for example, they would tell me, you know what, I will take my last six months as a representation of the data that I need to use in order to develop my model. And then I'm asking myself, uh, them, them, is, is it really representative of your uh, production uh, cases right now? So understanding what is the relevant distribution, what is the relevant history to develop your next model, understanding what are your weak spots in production instead of analyzing all kinds of things in the lab or taking all kinds of beliefs on about cases that maybe we are better at or worse at, you could take, given the monitoring solution in place in production, you could answer all of those questions automatically based on the tool that you have in place. You could go and ask yourself, what are the specific subpopulations that we're not optimized for? You could see that directly from production. If you need to ask yourself, uh, what is the relevant history in my case? So you could go and see what, where, how the distributions in production will look like. 
And what were the time frame? Maybe even two years ago, the distribution were looking a lot more similar to what we're currently experiencing. So a lot of questions could be answered once you have the information from production, but you just need to, to change the mindset instead of starting from the lab, starting from production, looking on production, understanding what's going on, and based on that, developing your next model iteration. Excellent. So now I want to ask about what you're doing at Supervise and how you feel because right now there's a ton of different solutions on the market. We also have the traditional solutions that you mentioned, like your data dogs or new relics and like Prometheus Grafana. How do you feel like you're differentiating yourself in that aspect as like a platform that is doing ML monitoring? So first of all, like uh, just to talk about uh, Prometheus, the data dog or uh, new relic, all of them are really great tools, but all of them are more like from the traditional IT monitoring, like Grafana is only a visualization tool. It's not really a monitoring tool, but uh, New Relic and, uh, and, and, and Datadog are really classical IT observability platforms. That's why we see them as complementary to our solution. That's also why we launched uh, our own partnership with New Relic in the last uh, few weeks. So if you want to learn more about it, I will be happy to, to share it. And regarding our unique approach, I think while working closely with our customers in the last uh, year, what we totally got and totally understood is the fact that model observability is all, is all about scale. It's not only about how do you start and monitor your first two or three models, but how you could be on top of it whenever you need to scale to dozens, hundreds, and even thousands of different models, how you could still be on top of it and get full, gain full control of, on top of your processes. And that's why we decided to create enterprise grade with all kinds of very sophisticated capabilities in place in order to automate. Everything that I've just said here is automated within our platform, our ability to detect the issues, our ability to understand uh, what's going on, our ability to correlate the different issues together. For example, we're not creating alerts. Alerts is something that we consider as very flat, where you could maybe define that a specific metric is having some kind of abnormality. We are creating something that we are calling incidents, where we are grouping all the relevant anomalies together to create you the full story, so you will be able to understand what's going on and actually to do like elf way, elf way toward resolving the issues. So the ability that supervisors provide to, uh, to customers is to automate the entire process to gain full enterprise grade solution to scale their activities and doing that while providing it in a SaaS fashion where everybody could start very easily and integrate and start to monitor the first few models, like in a manner of uh, five minutes using our documentation. Sweet. So the next thing that comes up, I guess, is if you're able to automatically figure all of this stuff out. I, I know there was a lot of questions when I was trying to put together like the ML monitoring tooling comparison page. And one of the questions that came up is like, okay, are you monitoring the machine learning models in production? Or are you monitoring the data? Are you monitoring the training? What is it that you're monitoring? And then there's that whole new paradigm or uh, I don't know, like tooling category that is trying to be created that's like the evaluation store and so you're monitoring at each step along the way how do you see what you're doing as fitting into that are you monitoring everything are you monitoring just a slice uh, what does it look like so that's a great question i think that uh, not i think what we're doing is actually monitoring everything as you said uh, in really to to be able to, gener to, you know, to generate the right insight and to understand what's going on in an automated fashion, you need to make sure that you are understanding what was the training data set of your model, what was the, you know, the baseline behavior of your model activities, what is the normal behavior of it. You need to make sure that you're on top of data monitoring in production, making sure that you're monitoring the data distribution of each different element, whether it's a feature, label, model output, or whatever, you need to make sure that you're uh, able to measure the performance level of your model activities. And of course, to understand all kinds of things like feature attribution and all kinds of patterns within the model in order to be on top of it whenever there is some kind of a concept. 
So we need to take all of that into consideration. But I think that the, emphasis, the thing that we are really emphasizing is the production elements. So we will, again, mm. take the, some baseline assumptions out of your training data set, but we are not like evaluation service for your you know, model development phase. We are a model observability solution whenever you go to production. And to do that well and in, in automated fashion, we need to get, uh, uh, we need to see how your training data set was look like. Okay. Now, one other thing that I've heard a lot come up in when we talk about monitoring, because it is one of my favorite things to talk about, it is the idea around you have, and you put it in the slide earlier, it's like just a, a simple baseline, like 10 models out there, you're generating all of this data and you're generating all of these metrics that you potentially want to be looking at. And uh, it doesn't matter how good your tool is if you don't really have any idea of what you should be monitoring or what you really want to put precedence over. I don't know if you have any any kind of um, uh, tips on and tricks for us on that one. So I think this is the trick. You need to go to the different persona within your organization and to ask them what is the actual use case of monitoring, what they want to know about, because... I don't want to know about a specific feature which is not important, is, is currently deviating. As a data scientist, maybe I want to know maybe when only my five top most important features are drifting. As a business persona, maybe this is not important for me if my input is drifting, but I do want to know whenever my model output, like whenever I'm starting to take different decisions, so what you really need to do is to go to all of those three different personas and to ask, them, to ask them, what do you want to know? When do you want to get alerted? And of course, where do you want to get? When, where do you want to get alert uh, at? Whether it's uh, your Slack channel, email, or whatever. Once you will ask them, you will get the right answers. And then you need to make sure that you have the right tools in place. Again, the technical challenges of having the right tools in place in order to automate the policies that they want to know about and to, to ensure that uh, your model is still valid. And so the last one, I think, because we're kind of running out of time, is along the alerts angle, I have some friends, and it's more with like the traditional software engineers and the DevOps friends of mine who talk about alert hell and how they set something up and then they get alerted all the time and it's just really noisy. How do you keep from falling into that situation where you're just alerting for everything and then after a bit of time, people get desensitized to the alerts and then something actually happens like the little boy who cried wolf, right? That, that's such a great question because again, I, I've talked about our uniqueness in our ability to automate the process but the result actually come exactly for that. Our customers love us because of the fact that we don't give them any kind of what I'm calling alert fatigue. Uh, alert fatigue is exactly what you were uh, describing, that you're defining some kind of a threshold and the next day you get, okay, you have 500 uh, uh, new alerts that you need to treat. You can't really be on top of it, but if you're automating the things in a light way. For example, you understand what are the use cases that you need to, to monitor. You have some kind of automation in place to detect the right anomalies and not like defining threshold that you don't really have any kind of common sense to understand what should be the right threshold. So only if you're automating those processes of detecting the real anomalies that are relevant and based on the inputs of the different uh, personas that are, need to be part of the process, only then you will be uh, you won't get such an alert fatigue. And again, this is something that we are really unique about. And again, we're producing, you know, for, it's like the precision recall type of challenge. You want to be on top of every issue that is important to the business, but on the other side, you want to be very precise and not creating uh, any kind of alert fatigue. And we have like a benchmark of like at least 30% of alerts that are getting a positive feedback from our customers which is a very high uh, uh, benchmark uh, relatively to the alert fatigue issues that you were just discussing. That's awesome. 
Well, this has been so good. Um, I appreciate your spin on things. I really like this idea of production first, and I really enjoy this presentation. If anyone is out there and they're interested, just go to, what is it? Superwise.ai. And exactly. you and are also, also in the community. So feel free yeah. to reach out. Yeah. yeah, he is in the MLOps community. Find him, Slack him, send a message. Uh, I really appreciate this, man. Thank you. And uh, we will see you all next week for the fourth out of four monitoring conversations. Hopefully this was very, very useful for everyone. I don't want to hear anybody telling us any kind of monitoring fails that they've had because we're giving you all kinds of good tips and tricks. If you're still watching and still enjoying this in the future, well, when it is on YouTube, we would really appreciate a like and a subscribe, all that good stuff that YouTubers do. So that's all we've got for today. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it. And we will see you next week. Thanks, Oren. Thanks, Dimitrius. Ciao.